What do Jack Duckworth, Marlon Brando, The Queen and Mike Tyson all have in common? The gym racing? No. And they're such delightful creatures. Vermins. Each one has got a personality. They carry disease and they want culling. I personally prefer them in a pie. They're like rats with wings. It is delicious though. Chinese people eat them a lot. Chewy. They're absolutely filthy, horrible, dirty things. A cross between chicken and... Some sort of fish. I can't see what good they are, really. Fancy that. Pigeons were used by the military to deliver messages during the First and Second World Wars. 32 of them were awarded the Dickin Medal, the most prestigious honour for an animal. Pigeon racing can be traced back 2,000 years, but how does it work? And basically it's, you know, it's the equivalent of owning a racehorse, but it's a racehorse in the sky. Yeah? Uh, it's got a competitive element. Yeah, um, basically anybody can take up pigeon racing, anybody can own a pigeon, anybody can enter a pigeon race. If you go down to the club, normally the pigeon fences will breed you then for nothing so you can start. But there's different, there's different levels in the sport like any sport, the same as you know, Man United at the top of the league. And then, you know, the real expensive pigeons now are really expensive. I mean, there was one sold for a quarter of a million last, last week, yeah, but you can, you can have great fun with you know, not needing to spend that kind of money. You can compete whether you have one pigeon or a hundred pigeons and you can win major prizes. And you can go from becoming, being a relative novice in pigeon racing to becoming an expert in pigeon racing. It's about breeding and developing your own pigeons. Yeah, well, I mean, what, what actually happens is on the Sputniks so out there, they have um, electronic pads. And uh, when you go to the, to the race, they have clip rings on them. And you scan the ring because if you scan uh, like an uh, item in Tesco's, and that 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 shows goes into the clock and says it goes to the race, and you bring the clock part home, attach it to the pads, and then when the ETS ring comes over the, the pad, it scans what time the pigeon's clocked and the ring number, and that's how you know, they know when what time the pigeon came back from the race. And that's got to be a better thing for the birds as well because in the past we've had race rubbers on them. You have to catch the bird, take the rubber off. Now. If a bird's flown 500 miles to come home to its mate and its nest, the last thing it wants you to do is go chasing it round. I think it's great because it, it keeps the wife happy and I'm able to take her shopping and I'm still able to race pigeons without having to sit in the back garden for a few hours. Great, everybody's happy. So, how do homing pigeons find their way back? No one knows the exact reason. Um, it's a combination of three or four things, the sun, the Earth's magnetic field. One of the latest theories is to do with smell, a bit like salmon in rivers. So apparently the right nostril of a pigeon is, is super sensitive to smell. Just recently we've been working with the Natural History Unit of the BBC and they fitted trackers to pigeons to, and what they were trying to do was prove that pigeons follow natural landmarks like rivers and so on. And looking at one of the traces uh, in a in a training race, these pigeons actually followed a motorway and in the trace they actually went round the roundabout. Traditionally, pigeon fancying is a sport that is passed down from father to son. However, the sport is beginning to die out. Our members are getting older and older. But it is difficult to get young people into the sport because of the intensity of the time you need to spend with birds. I think the main objective is really to just to get people aware of the sport, get kids to interact with the pigeons. I have two girls, one's 17 and one's 15. They, they hate them, I think. They, they don't like them at all. They don't show no interest whatsoever. So they've got better things to do than most pigeons. Our club used to be um, 26 members strong only about four or five years ago. Um, in them four or five years, we've gone from 26 members down to about nine. Um, a majority of that is to do with the elderly members not being able to race because of their health or even in some cases dying, it's sad but true. Sadly for pigeon racing, it's not just the lack of interest from younger fanciers that is damaging the sport. Pigeon racing has, um, has many pressures. Um, uh, some people don't like pigeon lofts being next door and there have, have been instances of arson attacks and so on. There is a tendency 
um, that so if someone's really successful in pigeons, that, that, that you know they can't be beaten. That, that that's some real bad people in the sport, and sometimes burn the loft down. He was in a bit of a bad state, mate, wasn't he? When he come out the fire, shall we say? All his flight feathers had melted. Horrible, sooty stuff. He was coughing up. So we put him in a cardboard box, nursed him back to health. Raced him last year, and he got his second, didn't he? But there's also a um, big problem with Europeans, uh, Romanians and people like that stealing them now. So they come around, they take the pigeons and then they sell them in Romania or, or whatever. And that, you know, there's been a lot of attacks in Europe and, that, and a few in the UK now where they, people are stealing them. Probably the biggest pressure on pigeon racing at the moment is the growth of uh, predator, uh, raptor numbers, hawks especially. Hawk numbers have virtually doubled over the last 15 years. Some of the fanciers are leaving the sport because they're not able to train and fly their pigeons. If they let their pigeons out, they're attacked by sparrow hawks, or sparrow hawks kill the pigeons. And, you know, basically it's taking a lot of the kind of the fun and enjoyment out of the sport. I just hope we don't get a hawk. Last week we lost one to a sparrow hawk. And, and you know, normally this time of year when you let them out, you normally get an attack. Barrels, they um, kills the pigeon, but during the winter they, they are attacking. Hawks are getting uh, more and more popular, they're protected now, so you can't do anything to, to, to you know, no one does anything to kill them or anything they are. You'll know because they, they'll scatter them. Won the fed. And then the next week we lost her, didn't we? Yep. I don't know whether the hawks had her or just. Not seen her since. Called me some names. <laughs> no, let me didn't you for losing your best pigeon. We're working with various organisations to try and find ways and means of, you know, deterring the raptors. But I think we're at, we're at the stage now where at some stage in 2012 we'll be applying for licences to remove the uh, the problem sparrowhawks from particular regions so we can still enjoy the sport. By remove, do you mean kill? Uh, kill could be one option, trap and release could be another. Yeah. This is a sport that is essentially about the relationships between fanciers and their birds. They depend on you, you depend on them and you, you do get very close to them. Yeah, when I was a kid I got keen on it with my father and we still race together now, you know, so around here when we're in my house now we race together with father and son. Come on, Dad. Go in. And then I thought, why don't I give it a go? And in 2002, I was involved in the Queen's Golden Jubilee One Loft Race, which was set up by the RPRA, and then that's when I first came into contact with the birds. My, my actual circumstances after the One Loft Race was I was getting divorced, so I was on my own. And I thought, well, a bit of a sad time in my life. If I've got pigeons to look after, I've got to pull myself together. Uh, and you just fall in love with them, they're such delightful creatures. I don't know a fancy that doesn't want to be there when his birds come home, because that is the thrill of seeing them come from 500 miles, folding their wings up and dropping out of the sky like a stone. There's nothing like it. It is a fantastic feeling. You let them go and they come back to you. It's a good thing. I think you get a deeper um, sensation and a deeper reward from them um, as far as you get get that interaction with nature. But you put your feet through there and you how to spell it like this. Like a Jack's always been um, quite interested in it and it's a good thing for him because he's a very hyperactive child, he's got a lot of energy. Look at him. Well done, look at him. I well, see a lot of myself in him, I, I, had a, I guess it would be called ADHD now. Well done. Jack's got something similar in him, I can see it. and. Uh, so he needs something that's constantly changing, constantly interactive, um, something that's unpredictable, and that's what the birds are for him. He, you can't predict how they're going to behave next. He doesn't know when one's going to fly past him, and it really fascinates him. Um, he's great at handling them, he loves handling them, he loves feeding them. You get to see the whole cycle of, of an animal's life, and, uh, and you get to influence it. Um, so for me, I, I'd always encourage my children to have animals, whether it be pigeons or whatever it is. It could be chickens, it could be cows, it could be horses, uh, it could be a dog. I don't really mind, but I think they need that to teach them vital lessons in life. And I just hope that when he's old enough to have his own, um, he'll be able to and that, and that um, he continues it when, when he discovers oh, women and booze, because <laughs> that's the temptation. <laughs> I think my proudest moment was in um, 
2004 when I won the first international race against the whole of uh, Belgium, Holland and everything against 17,400 pigeons and, and the winner was, you know, in the UK, which which uh, was only the second time an international race had been won in the UK. And so that's the, my proudest moment when the pigeon dropped and, and I won that race. Proudest moment, I think, is just being able to say you race pigeons and not to be embarrassed to say, yeah, actually I do and I, and I quite like it. Um, that, that was probably when I got to about 16 or 17 because I took a lot of mocking at school, you know, kids taking a mickey out of calling you Geordie Racer or Jack Duckworth or whatever. I got to that moment where I just thought, I don't care anymore what people think. My daughter was a teenager when I started in racing pigeons, so she'd help me out in the loft, but she wasn't particularly interested. But she's very proud of her mum now. She lets everybody know that her mum's a pigeon fancier. I think that the, the future of pigeon racing, we've really got to change the entire system. Um, it costs an average flyer about 80 to 100 pounds to join a club. So it's really hard to, to try and get youngsters involved. And I think the sport as a whole needs to evolve to incorporate younger people and to incorporate the modern man. Will the new technologies encourage younger fanciers into the sport or will it continue to die out? All right, I'm going to get on the pigeon <laughs> racing, I think. <laughs> They're fancy pigeons. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 It's not the old dance career, I'll just get on pigeons, yeah, that's fine. I was Googling. Yeah, I should get a medal. Pigeon racing, all the way.